the withered hand. And behold, there was a man which had his hand withered. Then saith he, that is Christ, to the man, Stretch forth thine hand. And he stretched it forth, and it was restored whole like as the other. Matthew chapter 12, verses 10 and 13. Although there were some great people occasionally in our Saviour's congregation, I find no notes of admiration about their presence, no beholds inserted by the Gospel writers to call attention to their appearance. No doubt there were persons well learned, according to the learning of the day, who came to listen to Christ, but there are no beholds about their having been present. Yet, in the synagogue, there was a poor man whose hand had been withered, and we are called upon to note the fact. It was his right hand which was withered, the worse of the two for him, for he could scarcely follow his craft or earn his bread. His best hand was useless. His breadwinner failed him. I have no doubt he was a very humble, obscure, insignificant individual, probably very badly off, because he could not work as his fellow craftsmen could. And as he was not a man of any rank or learning, his presence in the assembly was, in itself, nothing very remarkable. I suppose he had been accustomed to go to the synagogue, as others of his townsmen did. Yet the Holy Spirit takes care to mark that he was present, and to have the word, Behold, hung out like a signal that the crippled man was there. Tonight, dear friends, it matters very little to the preacher that you are here, if you are a person of some note or consequence. For we take no note of dignitaries in this place, where the rich and the poor meet together. But, if you happen to be here as a needy soul wanting a saviour, if you happen to be here with a spiritually withered hand, so that you cannot do the things that you would, and you are wanting to have that hand restored to you, there shall be a behold put to that, and especially shall it be doubly emphatic if tonight the master shall say to you, stretch out thy withered hand, and a deed of grace shall be accomplished. What our Lord wanted on that particular Sabbath morning was somebody to work upon, somebody whom he might heal, and so defy the Pharisees who said that it was wrong to heal on the Sabbath day. And that is just the case tonight. If you are rich and increased in goods and have need of nothing, my master does not want you. He is a physician, and those who practice the healing art look out for sickness as their sphere of operation. My master does not come into assemblies where all are quite content with themselves, where there are no blind eyes, no deaf ears, no broken hearts, no withered hands, for what do such folk need with a saviour? He looks around, and his eye fixes itself upon pain, upon necessity, upon incapacity, upon sinfulness, upon everything to which he can do good. For what he wants in us mortals is the opportunity to do us good, and not a pretense on our part that we can do him good. I begin with this because my talk tonight will be very simple, and it will only be meant for those of you who want my Lord and Master. Those of you who do not need him can go. You that want him, it may be you shall find him tonight. I do not know that our crippled friend, when he went to the synagogue that morning, expected to get his withered hand healed. Being, perhaps, a devout man, he went there to worship, but he got more than he went for. And it may be that some of you whom God means to bless tonight do not know what you have come here for. You came because you somehow love the ordinances of God's house, and you feel happy in hearing the gospel preached. You have never yet laid hold of the gospel for yourselves, never enjoyed its privileges and blessings as your own, but still you have a hankering after the best things. What if, tonight, the hour has come, the hour which sovereign grace has marked with a red letter in the calendar of love, in which your withered hand shall be made strong and your sin shall be forgiven. 
what bliss, if you shall go your way to glorify God because a notable miracle of grace has been wrought in you. God grant it may be so done by the power of the Holy Spirit. First, we will say a little about the person to whom the command in our text is addressed. Then said Jesus to the man, Stretch forth thine hand. This command was addressed, then, to a man who was hopelessly incapable of obeying. Stretch forth thine hand. I do not know whether his arm was paralysed or only his hand. As a general rule, when a thorough paralysis, not a partial one, takes place in the hand, it seizes the entire member, and both hand and arm are paralysed. We usually speak of this man as if the entire limb had been dried up, and yet I do not see either in Matthew, Mark or Luke any express declaration that the whole arm was withered. It seems to me to have been a case in which the hand only was affected. We used to have, not far from here, I remember, at Kennington Gate, a lad who would frequently get on the step of the omnibus and exhibit his hands, which hung down as if his wrists were broken, and he would cry, poor boy, poor boy, and appeal to our compassion. I fancy that his case was a picture of the one before us, in which not the arm, perhaps, but the hand had become dried up. We cannot decide positively that the arm was still unwithered, but we may notice that our Lord did not say, stretch out thy arm, but thine hand, so that he points to the hand as the place where the paralysis lay. If he had said, stretch out thy arm, as the text does not declare that the arm was dried up, we should have said that Christ bade him do exactly what he was capable of doing. But as he says, stretch forth thine hand, it is clear that the mischief was in the hand. And so he was asked to do what he could not possibly do, for the man's hand was assuredly withered. This is very important for us to notice, because some who hear the gospel think that Christ does not save real sinners like themselves, but only those people who are not quite so bad. If you feel quite dried up and utterly without strength, we are bidden to preach to you saying, Repent, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Commandments addressed to sinners who cannot, so far as moral ability is concerned, obey the command. Such are bidden so to do by him who bade the man in the synagogue do what he, naturally, in and of himself, was quite incapable of doing. Yet the Saviour addressed him as if he could do it. For the gospel cries to the sinful person in all his misery and incapacity, this very incapacity and inability is but the space in which the divine power may be displayed, that the excellency of the power may be seen to be in the gospel and in the Saviour himself, and not at all in the person who is saved. The command, then, which brought healing with it, was addressed to one who was utterly incapable. But mark you, it came to one who was perfectly willing. For this man was quite prepared to do whatever Jesus bade him do. If you had questioned him, you would have found no desire to retain that withered hand, no wish that his fingers should remain lifeless and useless. If you had said to him, Poor man, would you like to have your hand restored? Tears would have been in his eyes, and he would have replied, I would that I might earn bread for my dear children, that I might not have to go about begging and depend upon the help of others, or only earn a hard crust with this left hand of mine. I wish above all things that I could have my hand restored. But the worst of many unconverted people is that they do not want to be healed, do not want to be restored. As soon as a man truly longs for salvation, then has salvation already come to him. But most do not wish to be saved. Oh, say you, we truly wish to be saved. I do not think so. For what do you mean by being saved? 
Do you mean being saved from going down to hell? Everybody, of course, wishes that. Did you ever meet a thief that would not like to be saved from going to prison? But when we talk about salvation, we mean being saved from the habit of wrongdoing, being saved from the power of evil, the love of sin, the practice of folly, and the very power to find pleasure in transgression. Do you wish to be saved from pleasurable and gainful sins? Find me the drunkard who sincerely prays to be delivered from drunkenness. Bring me an unchaste man who pines to be pure. Find me one who is an habitual liar and yet longs to speak the truth. Bring me one who has been selfish and who in his very heart hates himself for it and longs to be full of love and to be made Christ-like. Why, half the battle is won in such cases. The initial step is taken. The parallel holds good in the spiritual world. The character I have in my mind's eye is the case of a soul desiring to be what it cannot be and to do what it cannot do and yet desiring it. I mean the man who cries in agony, to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. I would but cannot repent. My heart feels like a stone. I would love Christ, but alas, I feel that I am fettered to the world. I would be holy, but alas, sin comes violently upon me and carries me away. It is to such people that Jesus Christ's gospel comes with the force of a command. Wilt thou be made whole, my friend? Then you may be. Do you wish to be emancipated from corruption? You may be. And this is the way in which you may be saved. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. His name is called Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. He has come on purpose to do this to real sinners. Even to you is this glorious word of the good news proclaimed. God grant you grace to hear it believingly and to feel its power. Secondly, I want to speak a little upon the person who gave the command. It was Jesus who gave it. He said, stretch forth thine hand. Did our Lord speak this in ignorance, supposing that the man could do so? By no means, for in him is abundant knowledge. He knew that the man's hand was withered, and yet he said, stretch forth thine hand. When I read in scripture the command, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, I am sure that Jesus Christ knows what he is saying. Go ye, said he, into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Yes, to every creature. Suppose that some of his disciples had said, Lord, was there not a mistake about the persons? Why preach to every creature? Are not some of them dead in sin? We would rather preach to character. I have heard some of Christ's professed servants say that to bid dead sinners live is of no more use than to shake a handkerchief over the graves in which the dead are buried. And my reply to them has been, you are quite right. Do not do it, for it is evident that you are not called to it. Go home and go to bed. The Lord never sent you to do anything of the kind, for you have no faith in it. But if my master sent me as the herald of resurrection and bade me shake a handkerchief over the graves of the dead, I would do it. And I should expect that this poor handkerchief, if he commanded it to be shaken, would raise the dead. For Jesus Christ knows what he is doing when he sends his servants. If he does not send us, it is a fool's errand indeed to go and say, ye dead men live. But his commission makes all the difference. We are to say to the dead, awake, and Christ shall give you life. What? Wake first and then get life afterwards? I shall not try to explain it, but that is the order of the scripture. Awake, thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee life. To me, it is a sweet thought that he is able to give power to do what he gives the command to do. 
Dear soul, when you are bidden to believe, and you stand with tears in your eyes and say, I cannot understand and I cannot believe, do you not know that he who bids you believe can give you the power to believe? When he speaks through his servants or through his word, he who bids you do this is no mere man, but the Son of God. And you must say to him, Lord, I ask you to give me now the faith which you require of me. Give me the repentance you command. And he will hear your prayer, and faith shall spring up within you. Did you never notice, dear souls, Christ's way of doing his work? His way is generally this. First, to give the command. Then, to help the heart to turn the command into a prayer. And then, to answer that prayer by a promise. Take these specimens. The Lord says, make you a new heart. That is clearly a command. But, by and by, you find the psalmist David in the 51st Psalm saying, Create in me a clean heart, O God. And then, if you turn to Ezekiel, you get the promise. A new heart also will I give you. First he commands you. Next he sets you praying for the blessing. And then he gives it to you. Take another case and let it refer to purging. We find the Lord commanding us to purge out the old leaven. And immediately... There comes the prayer, purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. And then on the heels of it comes the promise, I will purely purge away thy dross. Or take another kind of precept of a sweeter sort belonging to the Christian. You are continually told to sing. Sing praises to God, sing praises, sing praises unto our King, sing praises. In another place, we meet with the prayer. Open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. And in a third scripture, we have the divine promise. This people have I formed for myself, that they shall show forth you my praise. See then the master's way of going to work. He commands you to believe or repent. He then sets you a praying that you may be enabled to do it. And then he gives you grace to do it so that the blessing may really come to your soul. For everywhere, gospel commands are uttered by Christ himself to men's hearts and they, receiving them, find the ability coming with the command. But he is not here, says someone. I assure you, in his name, he is here. His word is, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Till this age shall end, Christ will be where the gospel is preached, where his message is honestly and truthfully delivered with the Spirit of God. There, Jesus Christ himself is virtually present, speaking through the lips of his servants. Therefore, dear soul, with the withered hand, Tonight, Jesus himself says to you, stretch forth thine hand. He is present to heal and his method is to command. It is time for a few more words upon another point, and that is upon the command itself. The command was stretch forth thine hand, and it goes to the very essence of the matter. It is not rub your right hand with your left. It is not, show your hand to the priest and let him perform a ceremony upon it. It is not, wash your hand, but it is, stretch it forth. That was the very thing he could not do. And thus the command went to the very root of the mischief. As soon as the hand was stretched out, it was healed and the command went directly to the desired mark. Now, my Lord and Master does not say to any of you sinners tonight, go home and pray. I hope you will pray, but that is not the great gospel command. The gospel is, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. 
Paul stood at the dead of night with the trembling jailer of Philippi, who hardly understood his own question when he cried, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And Paul, according to the practice of some, should have said, Oh, we must have a little prayer, or you must go home and read the Bible, and I must further instruct you until you are in a better state. He did nothing of the sort, but there and then Paul said, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. There is no gospel preached unless you come to this, for salvation comes by faith and by nothing short of it. That is just the difficult point, you tell me. Yes. And at the difficult point, this command strikes and says, stretch forth thine hand, or in the case of the sinner, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. That stretching forth of the hand was entirely an act of faith. As an act of sense and nature, the man was powerless for it. He only did it because his faith brought the ability. I say it was a pure act of faith, that stretching out of the hand. I do not understand as yet, says one, how a man can do what he cannot do. But you will understand a great many other wonderful things when the Lord teaches you. For the Christian life is a series of paradoxes. The man who is seeking Christ can do nothing. And yet, if he believes on Christ, he can do everything asked. And his withered hand is therefore stretched out. But, in addition to its being an act of faith, it seems to me it was an act of decision. There sit the haughty, frowning Pharisees. Your imagination can easily picture those fine-looking gentlemen with fringes to their garments and phylacteries across their foreheads. There too are the scribes, all wrapped up in their formal array, very learned men. Persons were almost afraid to look at them, they were presumed so holy. See, there they sit, like judges of assize, to try the Saviour. Now Christ, as it were, singles out this poor man with a withered hand to be his witness, and by his command he practically asks him which he will do. Will he obey the Pharisees or Christ? It is wrong to heal on the Sabbath day, say the Pharisees. What will the man with the withered hand do? If he agrees with the Pharisees, of course, he will decline to be healed on the Sabbath day and will not stretch out his hand. But if he agrees with Jesus, he will be glad to be healed, Sabbath or no Sabbath. Ah, I see. He stretches out his hand and breaks away from the men who would leave his hand withered. The man voted for Christ when he stretched out his hand. Many a soul has found peace when at last he has held up his hand and said, Sink or swim, lost or saved, Christ for me, Christ for me. I will cling to his cross and to him alone will I look, for I am on his side. When that act of decision is performed, then comes the healing. If you hold up your hand, let us say your soul, for Christ, he will make it a good hand though now it is all paralysed and drooping like a dead thing. Unworthy as you are, he has the power, as you hold it up to him, to put life into it and to give you the blessing your heart desires. So I will just lead you on in the fourth place to notice this man's obedience. We are told that he stretched forth his hand. Mark says, and he did so. Now, observe that this man did not do something else in preference to what Jesus commanded, though many awakened sinners are foolish enough to try experiments. If, instead of obeying Christ, the man had walked across the synagogue and brought himself up to Christ, he would have said, I commanded no such thing. I said, stretch forth thy hand. Suppose the man had then used his left hand to grasp the scroll of the law that stood in the synagogue and had kissed it out of reverence. Would that have been of any use? The master would only have said, I said, stretch forth thy hand. 
Alas, there are many, many souls that say, we are bidden to trust in Jesus, but instead of that, we will attend the means of grace regularly. The command is, believe and live. Attend to that. Well, I shall take to reading good books. Perhaps I shall get good that way. Read the good books by all means, but that is not the gospel. The gospel is, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Never say to Jesus Christ when we are under searching of soul, Lord, I am told to trust thee, but I would sooner do something else. Lord, I want to have horrible convictions. I want to be shaken over hell's mouth. I want to be alarmed and distressed. Yes, you want anything but what Christ prescribes for you, which is that you should simply trust him. Whether you feel or do not feel, you should just come and cast yourself on him that he may save you. But you do not mean to say that you speak against praying and reading good books and so on. Not one word do I speak against any of those things. Let a person pray, the more the better. Let a person search the scriptures. But remember that if these things are put in the place of simple faith in Christ, the soul will be ruined. Let me give you a text. Did you ever hear it quoted properly? Ye search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life. But ye will not come unto me, that ye might have life. That is where the life is, in coming to Christ. Not even in searching scripture, good as the searching of scripture is. It matters not how good an action is. If it is not what Christ commands, you will not be saved by it. Stretch forth thine hand, says he. That was the way by which the healing was to come. The man did nothing else, and he received a gracious reward. Notice that he did not raise any questions. Now, this man had a fair opportunity of raising questions. I think he might very fairly have stood up in his place and said, this is inconsistent, good master. You say to me, stretch forth thine hand. Now, you know that if I could stretch forth my hand, there would be nothing wrong with me, and therefore there is no need for your miracle. And if I cannot stretch forth my hand, how can you tell me so to do? Have you not heard some people who like to ridicule holy things scoff at our gospel saying, you can and you can't, you shall and you shan't? Their description is right enough, though meant to deride us. We know that every person is dead in trespasses and sins, steeped in a spiritual and moral torpor out of which he cannot raise himself. Yet, by the Lord's own command, we say, Awake, thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee life. Or, in other words, we say to the withered hand, be stretched out, and it is done. The blessed result justifies that very command, which in itself seems impossible. Notice, further, that the man appeared to stretch out his hand by his own strength. But if you had asked him, did you of yourself stretch out your hand? He would have said, oh no, because I have tried many times before and I could not, but this time I did it. Then how was it that you were able to do it? Jesus told me to do it, and I was willing, and it was done. I do not expect that he could have explained how, and we cannot either. It must have been a very beautiful sight to see that poor, withered, limp, wilted hand first hanging down and then stretched out before all the people in the synagogue. They witnessed the blood beginning to flow, the nerves gaining power, and the hand opening like a reviving flower. They saw the delight of his sparkling eyes, as at first he could only fix them upon the little finger and the thumb to see if they were really all alive. Then he turned, looked at that blessed one who had healed him, and seemed anxious to fall down at his feet and give him all the praise. Even so, 
We cannot explain conversion and regeneration and the new birth, but we do know this, that Jesus Christ says, believe, and we believe. By our own power? No. But as we will to believe, and he gives us that will, there comes a power to do according to his good pleasure. I look around me, wondering, where is the man or the woman with a withered hand tonight? To such, I would say in my master's name, stretch out that hand. It is an auspicious moment. A great thing shall be done in you. Believe now. In the past you have said, I never can believe. Now trust Jesus. Sink or swim, trust him. Venture on him, venture wholly, let no other trust intrude, none but Jesus, none but Jesus can do helpless sinners good. Our Lord Jesus never casts away a sinner who trusts in him. If you do not feel that you can come, or ought to come, to Christ, being so unworthy, steal in, steal into his house of mercy, just as you have known a hungry dog steal in where there has been something to eat. The butcher very likely would deal him a kick if he saw him after a bone, but if he once gets it, he may as well make off with it and keep it to himself. However they come, he never says, Come here, you have no right to hope in my grace. Remember the woman in the press that dared not come to Christ before his face, but who came behind him and touched the hem of his garment. She stole the cure from him, as it were. And what did he say? Come here, my woman, come here. What have you done? What right had you to touch my garment and to steal a cure like this? Did he speak in indignation? Not at all. Not at all. He bade her come. And she told him all the truth. And he said, Daughter, be of good cheer. Thy faith hath made thee whole. Go to him, soul, behind or before, push to touch him. If there be a crowd of obstructions between you and Christ, plough your way through them by resolute faith. Though you are the most unworthy individual that ever trusted him, trust him now, that it may be told in heaven that there is a bigger sinner saved today than ever was saved before. Such a salvation will make Christ more glorious than ever. The last thing to consider is the result of this stretching out of the man's hand in obedience to the command. He was healed. The healing was not only witnessed, it was also immediate. The man did not have to stand there a long time, but was instantly healed. And yet the cure was perfect, for his hand was whole like the other, just as useful as his left hand had been, with all the extra dexterity which naturally belongs to the right. You may depend upon it, that it was permanently healed. For I have never read of any of the cases which our Lord cured becoming bad again, nor will it ever be. My master's cures last forever. I remember seeing in the shop window some years ago that there was to be had within a momentary cure for the toothache. I noticed after a few months that the proprietor of that valuable medicine, whatever it was, had discovered that nobody wanted a momentary cure. And so the word momentary was changed for the word instantaneous, which was a great improvement. I am afraid that some people's salvation is a momentary salvation. They get a sort of conversion, and they lose it again. They get peace, and by and by it is gone. What is wanted is permanence, and there is always permanence in the work of Christ, and his healing is never revoked. Do you see then what is to be obtained from the Lord? Healing for life, deliverance from the withering power of sin through life and through eternity. This is to be received by eager obedience to the matchless command, stretch forth thine hand, or, in other words, trust.
trust, trust. Only this week I was talking with one who said that he could not trust Christ. And I said, but my dear friend, we cannot have that. Could you trust me? Yes, he could trust me. Why then can you trust me and not trust the Lord Jesus? I will put it the other way. If you said to me, I cannot trust you, what would that imply? Why, said he, it would mean, of course, that you were a very bad fellow if I could not trust you. Ah, I said, that is exactly what you insinuate when you say, I cannot trust Jesus. For scripture says, he that believeth not hath made him a liar. Do you mean to say that? The person to whom I spoke drew back with horror from this consequence and said, No, sir, I am sure that God is true. Very well, then. You can certainly trust one who is true. There can be no difficulty in that. To trust and rest upon one whom you cannot doubt must follow as a matter of course upon your good opinion of him. Your belief that he is true is a sort of faith. Throw yourself upon him now. Just as I lean upon this rail with all my weight, lean like that upon the mercy of God in Christ Jesus. That is faith. Make it your sole hope and confidence. As a man casts his whole weight upon his bed, so throw yourself unreservedly on the divine love which was seen in Jesus and is seen there still. If you do this, you will be saved. And I do not mean merely that you should be saved from hell, for the power of faith working in you by God, the Holy Spirit, will save you from loving sin any more. Being forgiven, you will henceforth love him who forgives you, and you will receive a new principle of action which shall be strong enough to break the bands of your old habits, and you will rise into a pure and holy life. If the Son shall make you free, you shall be free indeed, and free you shall be at once, if now you trust him. The Lord grant his blessing for Christ's sake. Amen.